There are 196 countries in the world. 25 of them are very rich, defined as having an average wealth per person of over $100,000 a year. They are. But far more countries are quite poor, and some, which we're considering here, are very, very poor. These are the 20 poorest countries in the world, where the per capita wealth is under $1,000 a year, or under $3 a day. Every country is now more or less on a path to growth, but the poor ones are growing very, very slowly. If Zimbabwe continues at its current growth rate, it will qualify as a rich country in 2,722 years. What we want to know in this film is why some countries prosper and others stagnate, so that we can understand what rich countries are doing right and get a better grip on the challenges and hurdles facing poor countries. There are basically three factors that determine whether a country will be rich or poor. The first is institutions. Institutions are beyond important. Broadly speaking, rich countries have good institutions and poor ones have very, very bad ones. The correlation between poverty and corruption is direct. The richest countries in the world are quite simply invariably also the least corrupt ones. And the most corrupt countries are also the poorest. When countries are corrupt, they can't collect enough taxes to get the good institutions they would need to escape the poverty trap. Half of the wealth of the world's poorest 20 countries goes into offshore accounts. Lost revenues in these countries totals between 10 and 20 billion dollars a year. Meanwhile, without an adequate tax base, poor countries can't invest in police, education, health and transport. Now, a more generous way to look at corruption is that it's really a case of clan-based thinking. Say you're hiring someone. In the rich countries, you're meant to do so simply on merit, interviewing lots of candidates, then picking the best one, irrespective of any personal connection. But in poor countries, under the sway of clan-based thinking, that approach would itself be seen as corrupt. It's your duty to disregard the so-called best candidate from an anonymous bunch in order to pick someone from your own team, your uncle, your brother, your second cousin, the guys from the same tribe. As a result, poor countries don't allow themselves access to the intelligence and talent of the whole population. There's a second thing that keeps countries poor. Culture. What goes on in people's minds, their outlooks and beliefs. A striking statistic pops up here in relation to religion. If there's one generalization you can make about religion and wealth, it's that the less people believe, the richer they stand a chance of being. 19 of the richest countries in the world have 70% or more of their populations saying that religion is not at all important to them. The exception here is, unsurprisingly, the United States, which manages to combine great religiosity with huge wealth. More on that in a second. And conversely, the poorest nations in the world are also extremely believing ones. Here's how many people think religion and the supernatural is deeply important in the following countries. In the world's poorest country, simply everyone is a believer. Why is belief quite so bad for wealth creation? Because in general, religiosity is connected up with the idea that the here and now can't be improved. So you should focus on the spiritual and look forward to a next world instead. It makes quite a bit of sense when you live here. In the rich world, on the other hand, people are generally great believers in their capacity to alter their destiny through effort and talent. Incidentally, to explain the anomaly of the United States, religion seems not to slow down economic growth here because it's a particular sort of religion, an overwhelmingly Protestant and exceptionally materialistic kind. The American God doesn't want you to think of building the New Jerusalem in the next world. He wants it here and now in Kansas or Houston. There's another big factor that determines the wealth and poverty of nations. Geography. Poor countries are overwhelmingly located in the tropical regions. This isn't a coincidence. Life is, in many ways, simply far, far tougher there. The problems begin with agriculture. Tropical plants are generally a lot less packed with carbohydrates. Poor countries have worse soil too. Also, and perhaps surprisingly, a tropical climate can be disadvantageous to photosynthesis. Historically, a key determinant in the likelihood of societies growing rich was their possession of large domesticated animals, such as horses and oxen, which liberated a huge part of the workforce from having to plough by hand. But in tropical Africa, domesticated animals have throughout time been devastated by a further appalling scourge, the tsetse fly. 
This small fly, exclusively present in Africa because of its heat and humidity, knocks out animals on an enormous scale, making them sleepy or inactive, and has had a profound effect on the ability of Africans to develop technology, increase agricultural productivity, and amass wealth. It isn't just plants and animals that suffer in the tropics. In the middle latitudes, humans are open to a terrifying array of diseases, including... 100% of low-income countries are affected by at least five tropical diseases simultaneously. The magical temperature, which has helped to make rich countries rich, is 60.